Okay, so good day class. So today we're going to discuss about heavy reinforced concrete, piece test concrete, and steel construction. So first we're going to discuss about the foundation systems, the deep and shallow foundation. So the foundation system transfers the lateral loads on the superstructure to the ground. The horizontal component of these lateral forces is transferred largely through a combination of soil friction on the bottom of footings and the development of passive soil pressure on the sides of footings and foundation walls. So foundation systems are classified in two broad categories. The first are shallow foundations and deep foundations. So as you can see class in this figure, this is what you call the shallow foundations. This is what you can commonly see in our residential projects. Then you have the deep foundation. You can notice our school uh, here at USTP, it has the deep foundation because of the type of soil, which is very soft. Then we're going to discuss now about shallow foundations. So shallow or spread foundations are employed when stable soil of adequate bearing capacity occurs relatively near the ground surface. The keyword here is the adequate bearing capacity. So they are placed directly below the lowest part of the superstructure and transfer building loads directly to the supporting soil by vertical pressure. So the types of shallow foundations are spread footings are one your individual or isolated footings, so which are spread footings supporting feet, columns, and piers. So these are the examples. This is what you can commonly see here in the Philippines. And also have your step footings. This is the NGL, the natural grid line. This is the slope or pyramidal footings. You can see here, it's like the form of a uh, pyramid. But I, this is more trapezoidal in shape. Okay, then you have your step footings. So these are the continuous spread footings of foundation walls. Step footings are strip footings that change levels to accommodate a sloping grade and maintain the required depth at all points around the building. Then you also have the combined footings. So combined footings supporting two or more columns, this type of footing is used where it is not possible to center the footing beneath its supported column as in the case of columns located at or very near the property line. So in such case, the nearest interior column is selected and a combined footing construction is done under both columns. So when you do combined footing class, it is when the, col the distance between columns are too near. So if there's, it's very near, you only have a distance of 0 0.2, 0 0.3 meters, it's much better than if you combine them. Okay, so this is an example of a combined footing. Since the distance between the, this column and this column is not that great, so their footing is just combined. So the footing is designed so that the center of gravity of the combined load passes through the center of gravity of the footing area. So combined column footings are usually rectangular or trapezoidal in shape. Next, you have your cantilevered footings. This type of footing will be used in place of a combined footing under the same conditions. This type of construction, the footings of the exterior and their columns are connected by a tie beam or strap which is connected to support the exterior column. So the top of the beam or strap is usually placed level with the top of the footings. This is common class is if, for example, this is your firewall here, then your footing must, must be designed in this way so that you won't cross the property line. Okay. Always remember class that when you uh, do your construction, you must never get even an inch of the property of the adjoining uh, neighbor or the adjoining property to where you are constructing your uh, house or building. Then you have your continuous footings. So this may be supporting a line of columns. Supporting all of the columns by strips at right, right angles to each other. So they may be inverted slab or inverted T continuous footings. Then you also have the mat or raft foundations. So mat foundations like continuous footings are used on soil of low bearing power where there is a tendency towards unequal settlement due to unequal loading of soil. 
In this type of foundation, all parts of the foundation are so tied together so that they will act as one assist each other in keeping level and thumb. Then you have the steel grillage foundation. So when it is desired to avoid the deep excavation required for concrete and masonry footings, and when the load has to be distributed over a wide area of support, steel rails or beams are used to give the required moment of resistance with a minimum of depth. For steel grilled foundations, the foundation bed should be covered with a layer of concrete not left less than 6 inches in thickness and so mixed and compacted as to be nearly impervious to nature moisture as possible. The beams are placed on this layer. The upper surface brought to a light and the lower flanges carefully grouted so as to secure an even bearing. So subsequently concrete should be placed between and around the beams so as to permanently protect them. So the beam must not be spaced so near as to prevent the placing of concrete in between. So the center space between the flanges of the top layer of the beam should not be less than 2 inches and should be somewhat more for the lower layer, layers. So for example, in this one, you have the H uh, steel column, then you have a steel base, then you have here your I beams. So here you have a, a minimum depth of around 120, 100 millimeters. And the bottom, it's a minimum of 100 also. Okay, since we have finished about shallow foundations, let's discuss about deep foundations. So deep foundations are employed when the soil underlaying a shallow foundation is unstable or inadequate soil bearing capacity. So they extend down through unstable, unsuitable soil to transfer building loads to a more appropriate bearing stratum of rock or dense sand and gravel well below the superstructure. So the type of deep foundations are pile and caisson foundations. So when you say about pile foundation, a pile foundation is a system of end bearing or friction piles, pile caps, and tie beams or transferring building loads down to a suitable bearing stratum. So for example, this is your column load here, then you have the reinforced concrete pile cap. So this is the pile. So you're going to drive the pile up to the layer which is already hard. If the soil conditions are too bad for to have a shallow foundation. Then you have your end bearing piles, so it depends principally on the bearing resistance of soil or rock beneath their feet for support. So the surrounding soil mass provides a degree of lateral stability for the long compression member. Then you have your friction piles, so depend principally on the frictional resistance of surrounding earth mass to support. So the skin friction developed between the sides of a pile and the soil to which the pile is driven is limited by the addition of soil to the pile sides and the sheer strength of the surrounding soil mass. For example, the pile caps. Okay, for example, this is your pile caps and then you have your end bearing piles and your, your friction poles. Next are your wood piles. So, when it is required to build upon a compressive soil saturated with water and of considerable depth, the most practicable method of obtaining a solid and enduring foundation for buildings of moderate height is by driving wooden piles. Wooden piles are made from the trunks of trees and should be in a straight as possible, not less than 5 inches in diameter, a small end for light buildings or 8 inches for heavy buildings. So the piles are driven by a means of a drop hammer or with a steam hammer or a succession of blows being given with a block of cast iron or steel called the hammer which slides up and down. So the uprights of the machine is called the pile driver. So the machine is placed over the piles that 
the hammer fairly descends on its head. The pie has been driven with the small end down. So if this is this, this is the small end, this is the big end here. Okay, so the if you have a pile driver, that machinery will uh, drive this uh, pile up to the hard the hardest layer or stratum of the soil. In driving wooden piles with a drop hammer, the hammer is generally raised by steam power and is dropped either automatically or by hand. So the weight of the hammer used for driving piles for building foundations is usually from 1,500 to 2,500 pounds. And the fall varies from 5 to 20 feet. So uh, when you say uh, 20 feet, maybe that's around 6 meters. So the last blows being given with a short fall. Steam hammers are to a considerable extent taking the place of ordinary drop hammers as they will drive more piles in a day and with less damage to the piles. So the steam hammer delivers quick short blows from 60 to 70 to the minute and seems to jar the piles down. A short interval between the blows not giving time for the soil to settle around them. So in driving piles, care should be taken to keep them plump, meaning uh, plump class meaning it should be as straight and vertical as possible. So and when the penetration becomes small, the fall should be reduced to about 5 feet. So the blows being given by rapid succession. Whenever a pile refuses to sink under several blows before reaching the average depth, it should be cut off and another pile driven beside it. So when piles have been driven to a depth of 20 feet or 6 meters or more or refuse to sink more than half an inch under 5 blows of a 1,200 pound hammer falling at 15 feet it is useless to try them further as the additional blows results only in bruising and crushing the heads and points of the piles and splitting and crushing the intermediate portions to an unknown extent so when the penetration is less than 6 inches at each Blow, the top of the pile should be protected from rooming by putting on an iron pile ring about 1 inch or less in diameter than the head of the pile and from 2.5 3 inches wide by 5 8 inch thick. The head should be chamfered to fit the ring. Okay, so if this is the iron ring, you're going to chamfer that a bit, then you're going to place that at the top. So in driving in soft and silty soils, the pile, piles drive better with a square point. When driven into a compact soil such as sand, gravel, or stiff clay, the point of the pile should be shred with iron or steel. This is usually in the form of a cast conical point about 5 inch in diameter, secured by a long dowel with a ring around the end of the pile. So piles that are driven in or exposed to salt water should be thoroughly impregnated with creosote, dead oil or coal tar, or some mineral poison to protect them from teredo or shipworm, which will completely honeycomb an ordinary pile in 3 or 4 years. So piles should not be placed spaced less than 2 feet on centers, usually spacing in from 2 to 3 feet. When long piles are driven closer than 2 feet on centers, there is a danger that they, they may force each other up from their soil bed on bearing stratum. So driving the piles close together also breaks up the ground and diminishes the bearing power. Maximum allowable load on wood piles is usually 20 tons. So the top of the pile should be cut off or below the low water mark. Otherwise, it will soon commence to decay. They should then be cut either with concrete or with seven timber or steel drillage. The sure practice is to use the reinforced concrete cap, the method being to excavate 6 to 12 inches below the tops and one foot, 1 foot outside of the piles. Concrete is then placed around and above the piles, approximately 3 inches above the top of the piles. A layer or reinforcement ring in both directions is placed. Caps are usually 18 inches or more in thickness. Heavy timber grillages may also be used for capping. 
So these are bolted to the top of the piles and concrete footings laid on top of it. So the timbers of the grillages should be at least 10 inches by 10 inches in cross section and should have sufficient transfer strength to sustain the load and center to center of piles. It should be laid longitudinally on top of the piles and fastened to them by means of drift bolts. The advantage of timber grillage are that it can be easily laid and eventually holds the top of piles in place. It also tends to distribute the pressure evenly over the piles as the transverse strength of the timber will help to carry the load over a single pile, which for some reason may not have the same bearing capacity as the others. Where timber grillage is used, it should be kept entirely below the lowest recorded water line as otherwise it will rot and allow the building to settle. So steel beams embedded in concrete are also sometimes used to distribute the weight over piles. But this is too expensive method to be commonly used. Then you have what you call the concrete piles. So concrete piles, either plain or reinforced, possess many advantages over wooden piles and in general can be used in all places where wooden piles can be driven. Concrete piles are generally used where wooden piles will be subject to decay or deterioration by the action of marine worms. They are especially advantageous for foundations on land where the permanent groundwater is at a considerable depth. Wooden piles must cut on off underwater ash when subjected to an atmosphere is alternately wet and dry, they will decay. This is unnecessary with concrete piles and foundations under such conditions may not start so low would be the case if timber piles were used. In practice, concrete piles are generally reinforced. Concrete, reinforced concrete piles are of two general types. Those molded in place and those molded before driving. So spacing for concrete tiles, as piles usually from 2 feet to 6 inches to 4 inches to 4 feet. Concrete piles are extended at least 4 inches into the concrete of the footing. And where a steel casing surrounds the pile, 3 to 4 inches of concrete is required within the top of the piles and the footing reinforcement. So unless the casing is trimmed at a distance, in which case the reinforcements are allowed to lie under upon the butts of the piles. So class, you use concrete piles whenever it is uh, at disadvantageous use wooden ones because as discussed earlier, wooden piles, they decay and they are very susceptible to marine worms. Especially when you are uh, driving, uh, doing pile driving in areas near the ocean. So precast piles. So precast piles, these are usually molded into a yard at the site around to cure for four weeks before using. So in driving, a precast pile is provided with an iron ca cast point and a driving head is used in which a cushion of sand, rope, or other materials is placed between a driving block of wood and the concrete in order to prevent the crushing of the pile. Concrete piles are often sunk by means of water jet. This method is made possible by inserting an iron pipe in the center of the pile. Okay, so this is an example. If it's a square, sometimes 12 inches to 24 inches. Or it could be also hollow in the center. So these are the typical cross sections. Cast in place, piles are constructed in the ground. In the position, they are to occupy and are often reinforced. Practically all cast-in-place piles are covered by patents. So cast-in-place piles may be formed by any of the following methods. The first is a hollow cylindrical steel tube usually furnished with a type fitting collapsible steel core or mandrel is driven in the soil. The core is then collapsed and removed and the steel shell filled with concrete. Thus there is a shell or form for every pile. Mac Arthur Piles, Raymond Piles, this uses number 24 gauge shell in which a spiral of number 3 wire is encased. 
This is a commonly commonly called a case file. A steel tube is fitted at the bottom with a driving point and is driven to the ground for a required depth. Concrete is then poured into the hole, thus formed as the steel tube is gradually withdrawn. The driving point may be either a conical cast iron point that is left in place or, or a hinge cutting edge called an alligator point which opens as the tube is withdrawn. This is called an uncased pile. So a steel pipe or shell is first driven to the ground, the steel driving core is then removed and the bottom of the shell is filled with concrete to a height of about 5 feet from the bottom. Pressure is then applied to force out the concrete into the surrounding soil as the core is withdrawn. So these are known as pedestal piles. Then you have your steel piles. Steel pipe piles. So these are concrete filled steel pipes which are made to bear on rock or hard pan. The pipes are generally 10 to 18 inches in diameter having a thickness of 3 8 to 5 8 inches the pipe is driven in sections with a ha steam hammer and as additional sections are required these are attached to the driven section by means of a cast iron or steel interval sleeve and re-driven when the pipe has reached its rear bearing level it is cleaned out by blowing or dug out by means of ogres or similar tools the pipe is then pumped out and concreted Then you have also composite piles. So these are a combination timber and concrete or steel. They may be composed of timber piles with concrete coatings held in position by steel reinforcements in the shape of expanded metal or net wire netting. The latter are, are to be considered as timber rather than concrete piles. So when you say composite dust, it means that different materials are used for it. Now let's move into Kaison foundation. So Kaisons are cast in place, plain or reinforced concrete tiers or columns formed by boring with a large ogre or excavating by hand or shaft to endow the earth. To a suitable bearing stratum and filling the shaft with concrete. For this reason, they are also re referred to as drilled piles or piers. So here the suitable bearing stratum of soil or rock. And you have the caisson here. So rock caissons are socketed caissons that have a steel edge section or with a concrete filled pipe casing. So if this is the casing of the pipe, you're going to fill that with concrete. Okay, so let's move into Foundation walls are basement construction or cistern. So foundation walls, they provide support for the superstructure above and enclose a basement wall or crawl space, partly or wholly below grade in addition to the vertical loads from the superstructure. Foundation walls must be designed and constructed to resist active earth pressure and anchor the superstructure against wind and seismic forces. And see, this is the wall system here. This is the floor system. This is what you call your foundation wall. We're going to apply the damp proofing or waterproofing and also receive an active soil pressure from the outside. Then we're going to have a subsoil drainage system here. Then there's a positive anchorage required to resist. So it should be anchored to your floor system as well as to your uh, wall system. As in place concrete or concrete masonry units. Then you have your concrete ground slab. And the size of footing is based on the foundation wall load and the allowable soil bearing capacity. So this is another example of a basement wall. So what is important last when you are doing your basement wall is that it should be uh, waterproof. Otherwise, uh, water can come in easily. So, one common mistake last in uh, doing your foundation wall is uh, by using 
uh, concrete hollow blocks. Uh, why? Sometimes last, for example, if this is your hollow block here, uh, okay, let's, uh, let's divide. If this is your hollow block uh, from the inside here, this is from the outside, okay? So if you're going to place hollow blocks, when you do your finishing, sometimes it's only applied at the inner core, but at the outer core, it is still exposed. So there's a tendency always for the water to get inside. So the best possible way is to excavate around uh, the basement area and make sure that both sides they are properly uh, plastered and then both sides are applied with uh, waterproofing so this is especially true in with, even with your firewalls so you don't only waterproof one side you must make sure that both sides are waterproof otherwise water will still leak inside So this is the section of a cistern. So cistern tanks last. It's usually um, reinforced concrete with no masonry units. Okay. Now let's discuss about reinforced concrete columns. So there may be short or long columns. So Short columns occur when unsupported height is not greater than 10 times the shortest lateral dimension of the cross-section. Then long columns, they occur when the unsupported height is more than 10 times the shortest lateral dimension of the cross-section. Okay? Then there, is, there are types of RC columns. So reinforced columns may classify into five types. The first are tied columns. So these are columns with longitudinal bars and lateral ties. So the ratio of the effective cross-sectional area of vertical reinforcement to the gross com column area should not be less than 1% nor more than 8% and should consist of at least 4 bars of a minimum size of number 5. Lateral ties should be at least uh, 3 8 or 10 mm in diameter and shall be spaced apart not more than 16 bar diameters 48 tie diameters are the least dimension of the column where there are more than four vertical bars additional ties should be provided so that every longitudinal bar will be firmly held in its design position the reinforcement for tied column shall be protected by a covering of concrete cast monolithically with a core of at least 38 mm thickness Usually classed in the structural code of the Philippines, there's a standard for minimum thickness for your concrete. So this is an example class of a <coughs> uh, section of your structural. So here you can see the footing, then it rises up. This is the second floor line. And this is the top of the roof beam. Okay. What's important here, class, is that at least you have a brief idea of what it looks like uh, in the section. Because in the real practice, this is going to be designed, you're going to consult this and work with your structural engineer. Okay. Then you also have the spiral columns. So these are columns with longitudinal bars and closely spaced continuous spiral hooking. For spiral columns, the ratio of the area of the vertical reinforcement to the gross column area shall not be less than 1% nor more than 8%. So the minimum number of bars shall be 6 and the minimum number bar size shall be number 5. The five spiral reinforcement with minimum size of 3A shall consist of evenly spaced continuous spiral held firmly in place with the last three vertical spacer bars. The center to center spacing of the spiral should not exceed 75 mm nor be less than 35 mm or one and a half times the maximum size of the course aggregate. Protective covering for the column reinforcement shall not be less than 38 mm. Then you also have composite columns. So by the word itself, composite, 
it should be made of different materials. So where structural co uh, steel columns are embedded in the concrete core of a spiral column. Then you have combined columns where structural steel is encased in concrete of at least 7 cm thick, reinforced with wire mesh surrounding the column at a distance of 3 cm inside the outer surface of the column cover. Then you also have lally columns. So, lally columns are fabricated steel pipes provided that flat steel plates which holds a girder or girt and is filled with grout or concrete to prevent corrosion. Okay, so we're going to end our lecture at uh, the different types of columns. Then we'll continue uh, the next meeting with the dowel bars. Okay, so if you have any questions or concerns class uh, regarding our lectures or lessons, you can message me anytime as long as I am online, I will always reply. Okay, so I'm going to give instructions on our, at our group page on our next activity. So if kindly uh, check it from time to time. Okay, so see you next week and stay safe.